Good evening, my name is Kacper Paradowski and you're watching Poland Daily News. The presence of coronavirus has still not been confirmed in Poland, according to the newest information from Łukasz Szumowski, the Polish Minister of Health. However, the opposition presidential election candidate Małgorzata Kidawa-Błońska accuses the government of withholding true information from the public. The ruling party politicians are appalled that the coronavirus is being used for a dirty political game. Candidate for the President of the Republic of Poland, Deputy Speaker of the Sejm of the Republic of Poland. I call on Prime Minister Morawiecki and the government to reveal the truth about coronavirus cases in Poland. The safety of Polish women and men is the most important thing. When we find out that airplanes are arriving from Italy and everyone is being released home, if there is a shortage of surgical masks, the warehouses are empty, then this is chaos. People are afraid. This is not a matter to be subjected to a lengthy discussion. These are not matters for hours of debate, which would then only be used by political parties as a tool to promote their own righteousness and beliefs concerning the coronavirus. Virus. Nothing good can come out of this. Let's see, for example, Belarus. When there is definitely a regime, they would be afraid to reveal cases. However, just today they reported their first case of coronavirus. I truthfully think that any European government, in addition to the EU government, would not be hiding such information about Poland. If we get a signal of the first coronavirus case in Poland, immediately that information will be passed on to the Prime Minister and to all Poles by way of informing all of you, the media. As of today, we have not confirmed any cases of coronavirus. Mrs. Kidawa is speaking nonsense. In connection to today's statement made by Mrs. Kidawa Boyska, the Minister of Health Łukasz Szumowski decided to phone her. We later found out that he gave her all pertinent information and reassured her that the coronavirus has not yet appeared in Poland. If the situation changes, she and the public will be informed immediately. Coincidentally, daily briefings are made by the Minister of Health and the Chief of the Prime Minister's Cabinet in order to update polls on the situation each day. The Polish Minister of Health, Łukasz Szumowski, also initiated an idea of a meeting of all Ministers of Health of the European Union. Details are to come in the next few days. The coronavirus outbreak is spreading. At this time, the presence of the virus has been confirmed in 52 countries around the world. The first cases of coronavirus in Lithuania and Belarus have been reported. There are over 60 confirmed cases in Germany. According to the World Health Organization, over 80,000 people have fallen ill worldwide. Cases of coronavirus have been reported on all continents except Antarctica. Donald Trump said the United States are doing a great job in the battle against the virus. We have done, and our professionals have done, a fantastic job. We're working with other countries. We're trying to help some other countries. A couple of them have gotten hit pretty hard. South Korea and Italy in particular, they've been hit pretty hard. Uh, and it'll all work out. And uh, I just want to thank all of the people that have worked with us in government and some of these great professionals, because they have been incredible the job. About 68 percent of coronavirus infections in South Korea were associated with the Church of Jesus in Xincheonji, where the first case was reported in a 61-year-old woman. It is not known how she was infected. Since 1 a.m., 2,022 cases of the coronavirus have been noted, 26 patients recovered and left the hospital, 13 people have died. We checked about 110,000 members of the Xincheonji Church, which is about a third of all of its followers. Among them are 1,638 people who are quarantined. Nearly 60 cases of coronavirus infection have been confirmed in Germany. The German authorities do not plan to introduce a ban on free movement. The crisis group met yesterday and adopted its first resolutions. Passengers arriving from infected areas will need to provide information about their place of residence after landing, flying in not only from China, but also from South Korea, Japan, Iran and Italy. Italy has experienced the largest number of infections outside of Asia. Fear of the virus has led to sports events taking place without an audience and tourist destinations being closed.
There is also a growing fear that such measures will have a brutal impact on an already weak economy. What I'm concerned about now is this is a global natural disaster. It's unforeseen, it's something that can't be controlled, it's even difficult to contain this, let alone try to control this. According to a global market analyst, the impact of the coronavirus on financial markets will persist in the second quarter, and the global economy may fall into recession if the situation worsens. According to official Chinese data, the virus has so far caused almost 80,000 infections and almost 2,800 deaths. According to the World Health Organization, it has already spread to 46 more countries, in which around 3,700 cases and 57 deaths have been reported. The leader of the Law and Justice Party, Jarosław Kaczyński, commented on the contributions of former Prime Minister of Poland, Donald Tusk, in the presidential campaign during an interview for Polskie Radio 24. Donald Tusk's entire political activity shows that he was able to destroy our political custom, which was shaped during the first decade of the 21st century. He easily destroyed our principles, the decency in the Polish public life, and many other matters connected to this area. He was very effective, but his actions regarding other matters were less effective. Last night, unknown perpetrators fired pneumatic weapons at the office of MEP Ryszard Czarnecki in Nowy Dwór Madowiecki. The Law and Justice deputy claims that he has been the target of a hateful campaign for several weeks now. For a dozen or so days now, this office has been covered with hateful posters that destroyed its walls. In the end, someone decided to move from words to gunshots. This situation reminds me of the time when a fire was set to the office of the then Minister Beata Kempa. Yesterday, someone broke the window in the car of the Law and Justice Party councillor, Mr. Nizabitowski, who works with the office. The atmosphere of hatred towards us was growing and ended with shots being fired. That is all for tonight. Thank you for watching. Stay with us for Poland Daily Business. Good night. I'm Aleksandra Zarzycka and welcome to Poland Daily Weather. Let's take a look at the forecast for tonight. Snow will appear over Katowice, Rzeszów and Koszalin. Overcast weather on the west. Temperature will range between minus one degree in Białystok and Olsztyn to one degree in central on the south and on the west. And now over to tomorrow. Snow with rain is expected around Szczecin. Rainfalls we will see over western part of Poland. More sun will appear in central on the south and on the east. The temperature will range from 5 degrees in Koszalin and Rzeszów to even 8 degrees in Wrocław and Kraków. Let's see the forecast for the following three days. On Sunday, pressure will drop. Temperature will range from 6 to 10 degrees. On Monday, rainfalls will appear on the east and in central. Pressure will be low. On Tuesday, sky will clear up. The highest temperature we will notice on the southeast, 10 degrees. Thank you for watching and see you soon. You're watching Poland Daily Business and coronavirus is spreading across the globe, including Middle East. And it happens that uh, Paweł Rakowski, our correspondent from Middle East, is currently in Warsaw. Welcome to the show. Bonjour. And please tell us how the effect of the spreading is right now. The Iran, Iran as they Iran, tell, is... Iran's the, um, it's second after China, the... Uh, the biggest infected state in the in the in the in the, in, the, in, the, in the in the whole world uh, nowadays. Uh, well, it's estimated that around 15 people are already dead, but some said 50, even, uh, and uh, 150 people are um, uh, infected by the uh, by the virus, including the um, Iranian vice minister, health, health vice minister, um, Iraj uh, Hachin. 
Yeah, that's the name. That's the name. And nevertheless, um, uh, now and uh, and uh, Iran uh, nowadays is uh, is kind of blocked uh, by by its neighbors. Um, uh, there this is a pilgrimage close, season right of, now of to course, the Mecca. Uh, to, to the Mecca and also to the Shia shrines in in uh, South Iraq, as, uh, which, which is very important for the Shia community in Iran, and also Qom, the um, uh, the town outside on the outskirts of the Tehran, uh, south of Tehran, uh, one of the holiest places for the Iranian um, uh, Shia, where is the grave of the uh, Ayatollah Khamenei. Uh, all the all the diseases started there. Um, it is it is it is said that. Um, it started from the a Chinese worker who was working there, and uh, he just spread it, uh, the virus. He basically uh, returned from China. Uh, how did she? How he, did he get there? Well, that's that's the, the, that's the geopolitics, you know, like the cooperation between China and Iran uh, affected in in this way as well. And nevertheless, um, uh, Iran um, uh, Iran is blocked uh, by its neighbors. Even the um, uh, the governor of the uh, Najaf area in Iraq, in the uh, South Iraq, where the holy shrines um, uh, for the uh, for the Shia, uh, said that uh, the Iranians are not welcomed. Now that that they should stay at home, that uh, that they shouldn't come uh, to to have a pilgrimage, he resigned from the he officially resigned from the uh, from the benefits from the financial benefits which uh, the pilgrims um, uh, always like it's it's following. Uh, nevertheless, uh, Iran uh, like all the flights from the from the Iran to Iraq and also to to, to Lebanon are kind of uh, um, uh, are like hospitalized um, on the on the on the airport. And also, and also now it's like we, we can hear that the Saudi Arabia banned um, uh, Umrah. That this year there won't be any Umrah, uh, at least at least for the in, in Medina in the grave of the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, well, the Iranians, nevertheless, they're not going to Saudi Arabia for the last couple of years, so it's not their problem. But still, we but still we can see that uh, Kuwait, Bahrain, um, uh, Emirates, all, 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 all those all those countries, and Pakistan also, who, who have a uh, big contact with Iran, the, the coronavirus is starting there as well. The, Iran had a problem in political scheme very recently. Uh, the, the problems with women's rights, the problems with uh, veil. With everything, with, with almost everything. I mean, even even now with uh, the coronavirus, like Tehran uh, says that. Uh, because of the restrictions and, and embargo, which is uh, put it on, on, on Iran uh, for for its uh, po for political reasons, yes, for the for the nuclear program that uh, this country is leading, um, that they are unable to have efficient fight with the struggle with the with the virus. On, on the other hand, it's like the publicity, publicity it's like uh, doubting if uh, the regime it's, uh, it's it's reliable and also um, it's it's it's, it's like uh, truthful about the, uh, the scale of epidemic there, because uh, as we know, um, the authoritarian regimes uh, like to hide certain things, which is not um, uh, not on their hand. So, um, uh, so we can see that Iran is like uh, we need to do something because, especially like uh, last um, uh, last week, we had the elections in Iran. Just 40 percent of the Iranians uh, voted. So, so it's a decrease of the 25 percent uh, due to the last elections. But this is a sign of uh, uh, well. It's it's it's, it's of a, what of, of what. First of all, a uh, uh, big disappointment because um, uh, um, the, because of the embargo and uh, because of the blockade, um, the Iranian economy is almost collapsing. Uh, like uh, like for the last couple of uh, months, we had uh, um, uh, we had the internal uh, struggle. Uh, we had the internal um, uh, demonstrations. Uh, it's estimated that 400 people were dead during those fights. So um, uh, because because the oil price incre increased for the 12 cents yeah and this is a, this is a well this is a major uh, impact also after um, uh, in in Iran, we can see that uh, there is a big disappointment um, of, the, of of the regime. I mean, like um, even even do, do the last elections, uh, so-called reformators or so so so-called so liberals were not allowed even to participate uh, in the in, in the elections. So uh, here uh, here Iran is heading to the to the one direction to the kind of the uh, confrontation. What, that, what what will this mean? We don't know yet. We don't know yet, and the, 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 the time the mullah ruled may 
come to the end soon? Is that a possibility? Well, they are not any, they are not younger anymore. Yes, uh, we, we can, oh, there is there, the, the, it's it's a big yeah. question because in the following years definitely there are going to be some changes in inside the regime because of the um, uh, because Ayatollah Khali Khamenei, the the head leader of the Iranian um, Islamic uh, Iranian Republic, um, is not younger anymore. Like uh, so, so 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 like uh, in which direction Iran will go? Will, will the regime survive? Will see in the, in the next five, ten years. And the handling of the virus will be the major argument. Yeah, and to, also and, uh, and to the, 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 the people on the street. I mean, we don't talk a political. Yeah, yeah of the, course. The it, 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 it is the major test. If uh, it is the major test of the of the of the um, of the capabilities of uh, of the of this regime. We know that this re, this re regime is very effective in the foreign policy, in the regional policy, but how it's in the domestic. It's the other story. We saw this vice uh, minister of health, Iranian vice minister of health, who was uh, presenting the case on the press conference uh, while exhibiting the symptoms of the disease and yeah, the question how this will play to the credibility of the regime inside Iran. Um, uh, yeah, of course. Uh, but uh, the, the other thing we can see that the uh, that the effect of the killing of the uh, general Hassan Soleimani already went into the, in, into the history. I mean, like few weeks passed, and uh, we can see that yeah, that um, uh, we have the kind of the continuation of the falling of the regime, or at least struggling regime. Pavel Rakowski, correspondent of, of uh, Middle East. Thank you very much for this Thank conversation. And that was it for Poland Daily tonight. I'm Alexandra Zarzycka and welcome back to Poland Daily Weather. Let's take a look at the forecast for tomorrow. Snow with rains expected around Szczecin. Rainfalls we will see over western part of Poland. More sun will appear in central on the south and on the east. The temperature will range from 5 degrees in Koszali and Rzeszów to even 8 degrees in Wrocław and Kraków. And now let's see tomorrow's forecast for our continent. In the Balkans, temperature will range from 10 to 15 degrees in Athens. The weather will improve in Scandinavia. There we will see loads of sun, but little lower temperatures, ranging from minus 2 degrees in Oslo to 3 degrees in Helsinki. Overcast weather in British islands and a maximum 11 degrees. Much more sun is expected on the South Europe. The highest temperature we will notice in Lisbon, 18 degrees. Thank you for watching and have a nice day. Good day, everyone. My name is Maria Konzielska, and you are watching Poland Daily Culture. Would you have enough courage to come to someone who is drunk or addicted to drugs and ask them, how are they doing? Krzysztof Savinski is doing that every day and much more. Krzysztof, thank you for being with us. Hello, everyone. And I am very eager to learn more about your foundation. Krzysztof, you have established a foundation which mission is dedicated to shared evangelization among the young people. How does it start? It started with the voice of the Lord. I mean, he, he told me to do that. So if he tells me something, sometimes it takes a little, sometimes uh, I, I constantly, instantly uh, just do it. But uh, he spoke to me and told me that I should do this. So I did. And he, he's blessing this, this, uh, this ministry, this, this foundation. And what initiatives do you undertake in the frames of this foundation? We visit uh, many places to preach the gospel. Uh, we make music that worships God. We plan to expand our work, to go to mo much more places, to just preach the gospel. This is the, the main reason for this foundation, to preach the, the gospel in every way that we can, using our talents, because we also, uh, my wife uh, sings, I write, she writes also poetry or articles about Jesus, about word of, uh, word of God. And so we make uh, many different things 
in order to uh, to preach the gospel. We do a lot of uh, this preaching on the web. Uh, we uh, have a YouTube channel where we uh, post our prayers. My wife, um, she leads a prayer. It's uh, some kind of devotional prayer uh, that lasts for like 30, 40 minutes each. She just sits behind the piano and she, she worships, worships God. She sings spontaneous songs to, to, to God that comes exactly from her heart. Sometimes it's not even worked before. It just comes in right in the middle, in the middle of the, the prayer. And then we make songs out of these prayers. And uh, recently we, uh, we established a, 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 a CD, a long, long play that, uh, that has eight songs. They came from the heart of prayer. And despite the fact that you and your wife both are secular people and you have a family, you decided to, to devote your life to God. And how did it change your everyday life? Well, uh, we travel a lot because uh, the gospel is needed, needed everywhere. So, so we, we travel to many different places. Also, outside of Poland, we've been to Norway, to, to Great Britain, uh, to Italy. Even next week, uh, we go to Germany to preach the gospel. And we just uh, feel that uh, there is a need to show the people that uh, we can live with God as a family, as a marriage, we can be a testimony and we can build our lives upon this rock that is Jesus and his word and his teachings. We just want to show people that every day we can be a living testimony for Jesus, of Jesus. Even if we are not a priest or a monk, we can, uh, we can just be a testimony and we can preach the gospel. And that's what the church says, because the church says that uh, every baptized person uh, has an obligation to be a testimony, to preach the gospel. And we just follow the church's church teaching. And in one of the interviews, you admit that people right now are eager for the hope and uh, for faith, but they are not looking for it uh, in God. And could you uh, give us an example of someone um, who you actually uh, changed, who found his faith. This is something that the world is teaching us, that uh, God isn't uh, giving hope and everything that's good. We, we believe that uh, God is someone distant, is someone that doesn't care about us. When we read the Bible, when we read what the church uh, has to say about God, we see that he's a loving person, he's a loving father, and that's something that we preach. That's something what, that we say to people. God is your father. He wants to talk with you. He wants to, you to spend your time with him like a loving father. And he's someone that wants to do good in your life. For example, in our communi community, there are people that uh, heard the good news and they heard uh, too many normal words, like reg regular words, like when we, uh, we've been to prayer, someone took the microphone and said that here in this place, there is a person that is struggling with depression. God is telling you right now, you are not alone and he wants to break you free. He wants to break your chains. And suddenly this person, I, I heard about that later, uh, this person suddenly that day started to believe in God because he was, uh, he was someone that wouldn't believe in him. He was just there uh, in his hood and he was like, don't touch me, don't speak to me. But God has spoke to him and he, he has changed his life exactly that day. And uh, later he, he started to follow Jesus. He started to read the, the word, uh, read the Bible. And uh, those lies that he had about uh, Jesus, about who God is, those lies were taken away he started to see God in, in a true way. And now he's a person that is with me, a leader of a youth community in our parish. And uh, we together work with young people and we see me many young people that come and they change their lives with God. They hear that God wants to be in their lives, 
not outside of their lives. And they start to just read the word, follow it, do the word in their, in their lives. And we have many uh, young people in this community that um, are just preaching the gospel because it is something that changed their lives, their daily lives. We have few people that uh, attempted suicide and uh, hated their lives. And now, after God has changed them, they give the testimony to many people and say, I didn't want to leave. Now I want to leave because Jesus has showed me that I'm wor worthy, that, I'm, that this life is worthy living for, that uh, I have many things to do, that I can live for God, I can live for other people. We see every day that God is doing many different things in our lives, in the lives of the young people, that are near, or also when we uh, travel, there's a few few examples of uh, how Jesus changed uh, lives of uh, prisoners because we also go to to prison uh, sometimes and we preach the gospel there, and then they get my number, my mobile my mobile phone phone number, and they just call me later and say I'm out six months, I'm free, I, I don't drink. I go to, to, to Mass, I, I am in a community, and uh, my life has changed. And uh, I could uh, speak about these changes all the time, because God is working. He's doing many things right now. Even if you are not a believer, it is worth to listen to word that life is good and your life means, and that there is hope out there. Maybe this hope you can find in God. That's Krzysztof's advice. If you are seeking for it, follow him. But the most important, have hope also in your life. And thank you for watching Poland Daily Culture. Welcome to Poland Daily History with me, Nicholas Richardson. We're looking in this series of programs about Poland's relations with its nearest, nearest neighbors. And next we're going to look at Poland's relations with Hungary. And I'm joined to discuss this in the studio with Professor Krzysztof Jabłonka. Professor, Poland and Hungary became Christian countries more or less at mm. the same time at the end of the 10th century. How did this lead or help their relations as nations develop? In the beginning, it must be said that there is no friendship in Europe more beautiful than the Polish-Hungarian one, which is more than a thousand years old. Although the beginnings were very dangerous, as the Hungarians in general are perceived as an exceptional nation in Europe, they came completely from the outside. They are not Indo-European like most countries in Europe. They are Asian-European, Finno-Ugric people, meaning they derive from somewhere near the Ural Mountains. There live tribes that speak a similar language. And when the Huns disappeared completely, they were replaced by the Hungarians. Thus, in most European languages, as well as in Latin, Hungary bears traces of the Huns, although they are not related to the Huns. At that moment, it was a very tribal state. It almost broke up the German Empire, the Carolingian Empire at the time. The beginning of Poland's contacts with Hungary began with the burning of Kraków, where several thousand axes were preserved, which were then a payment product that melted, and a huge layer of this material formed. This is an example of the foundation on which the friendship was built. It is only when Hungary is baptized, and it was gradually being baptized in 973, that the son of the ruler of Geza visits the Roman Emperor Otto in 975, that the missionaries come, and in 977, the ruler and his son Vike are baptized, who takes the name of Stephen, in the future Stephen I of Hungary, and finally the whole Hungarian nation is already very much mixed up with the Slavs. And at this point, an alliance with the Poles follows, in a very special way, might I add. The son of King Emmerich establishes contacts with Bolesław I the Brave, and two great rulers form an alliance. 
From that moment on, for example, Ladislas I, the ruler of Hungary, grew up on the Polish throne. He took in his relative, Bolesław I the Brave, when the Poles expelled him from the country, and Poland and Hungary saved each other and lived in unity. There was prosperity. Hungary went to help Poland. Let us remember that Hungary was richer than Poland. They had gold mines, huge territory, the whole Danube Valley. Vice versa, when Hungary was broken up by the Turks, it was the Poles who came to help Hungary, and Hungarians found asylum on Polish territory and the possibility to continue fighting for their independence. This continued until the 18th century. Hungary was in union with Poland three times for about 40 to 50 years. Once a Hungarian king was king of Poland, that is, Casimir the Great's nephew, Louis the Great. Later on, the son of Vladislaus, Władysław III, or Władysław of Varna, will be the ruler of Hungary and will die in the Battle of Varna, hence the nickname. Finally, the brother of Władysław III, Casimir the Great, his son, Vladislav II, will become king of Hungary and Bohemia simultaneously. It seemed that the Aguilonian dynasty would already come to Hungary. But unfortunately, there was a very dangerous battle with the Turks, lost by the Hungarians at Mohács and a mysterious death of their king. We Poles, as well as a large part of Hungarians, unfortunately see the hidden hand of the Habsburgs here. These rulers would keep on strangely dying, one under Varna and the other under Mohács. This immediately would make the throne available for the Habsburgs. Hungary fell into the hands of the Habsburgs, at least northern Hungary. The center of the country was occupied by the Turks, and in the east, the Duchy of Transylvania was established. And so it stayed that way until the Battle of Vienna, after which the whole area was regained, but Germanized. At first, the Hungarians treated it as a tribute to God, something that had to happen. They had no strength. However, at one point they decided to make a change and the Spring of Nations rebuilt Hungary from within. The most beautiful Spring of Nations was, in fact, in Hungary. Well, Professor, we, we sort of reach 1848 and the, and the so-called Spring of Nations. And of course, this is a time when uh, General Bain became a true leader in Hungary. How did this happen? It must be said that the Spring of Nations did indeed embrace all the nations of Europe. There is a saying that the nations that were not embraced by the Spring of Nations no longer exist. The most beautiful spring, however, was in Hungary. At first it was supposed to be just an internal reform, but very soon the Hungarians claimed their independence. And the Hungarian poet, Sandor Petofi, was able to deliver a beautiful poem, Talpra Magyar, Get Up Hungarians. Today or never, we swear, by God alone over us, never to be slaves again. And it resurrected as if the spirit of independence and the fight for independence against the Habsburgs began, not for reform anymore, but for independence. However, the Hungarians did not get along with the absolutist government in Vienna. This government also had a revolution in Vienna. And it was from the Vienna Revolution that Joseph Bem came to Hungary, where he commanded the Viennese. He was a Pole, born in Tarnów, but had relatives in Hungary. So the Hungarians also saw him as their own. And Bem initially became commander of Transylvanian troops, and in a very short time freed three-fourths of Hungary from Austrian rule. He would probably have been the commander-in-chief if it hadn't been for the aggression of Tsarist Russia. And unfortunately, tens of thousands of Tsarist troops poured into Hungary through the Carpathian passes and a significant battle took place, in which the second Polish general, Henryk Dębiński, became the commander-in-chief. The two Poles commanded a heroic battle at Temesvar, today Timisoara, in the south of Hungary. This battle was unfortunately lost, as the Austrian and Russian armies were too strong. 
On August 8, 1849, the Spring of Nations was extinguished. Bem emigrated to Turkey, where he set up a camp for refugees, tried to support them somehow, distributed all the funds to them, and he himself accepted Islam. His name was Murat Pasha, and he was entrusted to Aleppo. He defended Aleppo from the bandits. Today Aleppo is unfortunately in ruins, but he is also a hero of Syria. Unfortunately, he died from the plague, and when his body was taken after the First World War, it was covered with four banners. This was because Syria bid him farewell as their liberator, Turkey as their general, Hungary, Romania, and finally the Polish flag covered his coffin. He rests in a park in Tarnów. Since he accepted Islam, he could not be in a Catholic church, he was buried in the park on beautiful columns protruding from the local pond. That's all we've got time for on this edition. I'd like to thank my guest, Professor Krzysztof Jabonka. I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you for watching. And do join us again as we delve into the annals of Polish history. Promised you, we promised you a uh, castle, and boy, that's a castle right there. But it looks more, it's a strange uh, it doesn't construction. Look like a castle. It's not a normal castle, but it looks strong. It looks like yeah, a fortified. It, it was a living place for, for, the, for, uh, for the current king, and every single king and after then. So, uh, some kind of hotel, you know. And uh, now we have a museum here. Uh -huh. uh, that's a national museum. And um, things you can uh, look uh, on, on, on over here are very interesting. Yeah, you got a very good collection there. So if somebody's visiting here, you recommend they go and see and, the and, museum. And, yeah. What's in the museum? You, got, you said a sword that's taller than we are. Yeah. What else uh, is there? Uh, the um, paintings uh, of uh, every single king uh, we had. Uh, and then uh, depending on the time, the, uh, the different uh, exposure. Different what? A uh, different uh, armor and stuff like that, or uh, 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 no, armor, things from weapons. different times. Yeah. yeah, weapons. Mostly. Okay, normal castle stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, who built this castle? Oh, uh, the, this castle wa was built in the beginning of se of 17th century uh, for the King uh, Vladislav. For King Vladislav in the 17th, beginning of the 17th century, so 1600s. So before Sobieski, uh, um, yeah, it, not even. Uh, but during uh, the Lithuanian-Polish Union, right? So it was a strong point, yeah. But this was more of a hotel than a castle, right? Yeah. Because we can see from the construction, still strong. Yeah. So, uh, so, uh, some kind of palace. Yeah. But, but more we, like we, a we still. Uh, Did you call it a castle? Yeah. 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 What are the most important things to do if I come to, to this town? What do you recommend? Uh, what, what are the best things about this town? One of the best things about uh, uh, this town, uh, you can visit our museum that you can uh, see here. Uh -huh. You can see the museum where, where the Simon works. The, the, the beer museum. museum. Yeah. yeah. Shimon, who was with us in previous episode, our yeah. new, new pal. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the, multi, the multicultural uh, part of the city. The, the different or, churches. Or, uh, Orthodox uh, uh, church, the, the synagogue, the, that's pretty close to this building. Where's the synagogue? Uh, just go up the, the street and then the first left. We'll go up the street and the first left. Well, let's go up there. Okay, okay we'll be right back. We're gonna go look at the old synagogue building and uh, put a fine point on this here multicultural history over many, many centuries of Piotrkov Trubanowska. Come on, let's go up there. Right. Actually, that's nice, I like that. Hello and welcome to Poland Daily Travel and another series of episodes. Glad you could be here to watch. Today we head to southern Mazowiecki province. We're heading to the city of Piotrkov Trybunowski. And what a place it is. Well worth the effort 
of stopping by. It may be one of Poland's best kept secrets as far as small towns or smaller cities are concerned. It has a rich history dating back over many centuries. The first same or parliament was organized here, as well as the first judicial tribunal, hence the name Trybunowski. It's about halfway between Warsaw and Czestochowa, and centered directly in the heart of Polish people. It has a rich Jewish history and was a melting pot of ethnic groups over hundreds of years, right up until the Second World War and the Nazi German invasion. Because of its picturesque setting, lots of feature films have been made here. There was even one with Robin Williams called Jacob the Liar. Jacob uh, may have told untruths, but uh, I'm telling you no lies. Surprises are in store too as we head to the Politsa River. So stay tuned to Poland Daily Travel. Watch our episodes. Like us on Facebook at Poland Daily Travel and on YouTube at Poland Daily Live. Poland Daily Travel, why do we do it? We do it for you. I'm Will and thanks for watching. Okay, so here's, here are Daniel and I, and we're standing in front of the Reconstructed Synagogue. And we'll leave you with, uh, with that picture uh, from our short trip to Piotrów... Piotrów? Trzebunowski. Trzebunowski. <laughs> <laughs> Where Daniel is a tour guide in the local tourist office. We want to thank him for helping with Poland Daily's uh, little tour around the town. We'll have to come back when the weather is better. Thank you very much, Daniel, who's also a guitarist, and he has a fine rock and roll band, or so I hear about these parts. From him, why not? Yeah, okay, <laughs> yeah. There you are. Okay, we're on the road. See you in the next episode, which may involve a lake.